welcome everybody to the uh, October uh, meeting of the Raleigh Astronomy Club uh, Imaging Subgroup. Glad to see so many folks come out tonight. That's great. Unfortunately, Steve can't be here tonight. Uh, he unfortunately had a last-minute uh, work commitment that came up that he couldn't uh, couldn't change. So uh, he asked me to go ahead and kick this off. We have a really great session tonight. We have um, uh, Guilain Rochon. I hope I said that correctly. Speaking <laughs> on uh, uh, my French is abysmal. By the way, my French game is even worse. Um, but uh, speaking to us from uh, Ottawa, or the Ottawa area in Canada, of course. I think all, everybody here knows that he is the creator of Backyard EOS and Backyard Nikon, which I guess is just coming out. Yep. And this is, uh, he's going to actually talk about the product tonight. This should be a really good session. Uh, one thing about it is um, the week he, when we were talking about it, uh, we really wanted it to be interactive. So if you have questions, you know, please you know, feel free to ask them. You need one of the microphones uh, to ask the questions so he can hear you. <laughs> So uh, without further ado, uh, we'll just go ahead and, and pass it off to our guest of honor. <laughs> thanks. Well, uh, thanks for the introduction. And first of all, thanks for, uh, for having me tonight uh, for your session. It's, pretty, it's an honor for me as well. Uh, like mentioned, I, I, uh, I'm the creator of Backyard EOS and soon to be released Backyard Nikon. Uh, I'll show you Backyard Nikon as well uh, during the uh, session tonight. But uh, first and foremost, uh, this is not a sales demo. This is a demo for you guys to understand the software. So it is interactive. If you have a question, uh, hopefully somebody in, 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 the, uh, in the room can, can moderate the questions and pass the microphone around. Stop me. I'll take a few minutes, answer the question. And if we go on a tangent uh, to explain a feature that I was not necessarily going to demonstrate tonight, then, then so be it. That's, that's the purpose of this session. It's, it's for you guys uh, and not necessarily for me. I'm, I'm just contributing to your knowledge here. So don't be shy if you have a question. So, uh, so I'll, I'll just to give you a brief history of, of what Backyard EOS is, uh, or or how it, it came about. Uh, how can I put that? It was a mistake. It was not supposed to happen. Uh, when I bought my Canon 40D in 2008. Uh, I was very surprised by the uh, limited uh, software that was available on the market. There was never a lot of the, uh, that, and that was basically it in 2008. And there was a few things in there that it didn't do uh, for me that I wanted the software to do. Uh, I mean, I'm a software developer. I've been doing it for close to 30 years now. So for me, it was just playing... Uh, uh, like playing in, in, a, in a park, uh, sitting at the computer and writing software. So I wrote my own software. Initially, it was just for focusing, trying to focus using my Canon uh, 40D DSLR. But everything went so fast that, that I started to post on, on cloudy nights, and people said, well, maybe you should make a product out of it, and, and so on and so forth. And that was in, uh, that was in September 2010. And, and then I rushed everything in, and in November 2010, I released the first version of Backyard US, and the rest is, is history. So it really was a mistake, uh, but a good mistake, I guess, because it's, it's, uh, uh, it is what it is today. And it is what it is today because of users like, like you uh, recommending some, some uh, features and keeping the conversation alive. Uh, it, is, it is a commercial product. It is sold uh, at a very cheap price, uh, and the reason being, I want people to to talk about it rather uh, uh, rather than me uh, having a big uh, marketing strategy. Uh, I'd rather sell it cheaper and have more people talk about it, and and you guys are my marketing department by talking about Backyard US and the fact that it's packed with features and, and low cost. So that is about my sales pitch for today. Uh, I will now share my screen and move to, oh, I scared somebody away, uh, move to the actual uh, presentation of the software. So can everybody see my screen? I can somebody confirm with the microphone that you can see my screen? We're supposed to be seeing your computer screen because we don't see that. 
Oh, you don't see my you don't see my monitor? No. Okay, see what's going on here. Screen share. Uh, something's coming up. Uh, it's the camera of us again. Okay, that's okay. So oh, there it now? is. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. Okay. Got to love technology. So, uh, what I'm going to be showing you guys today uh, is basically a major uh, uh, overview of all the major functions in Backyard EOS. I've got a few instances uh, running right now. Uh, I've got Backyard EOS. Uh, I also have Backyard Nikon. Uh, and uh, I also have a copy of Backyard EOS with a simulator uh, camera because uh, I want to be able to show you a few things that I can't really show you in-house. I'm in my basement right now uh, in my house and uh, I can only point the camera to, uh, <laughs> uh, to something inside. So there's a few features that I want to show you. Uh, simulating that as if I was outside. So every now and then, if I show you the simulator, I will make sure to uh, make sure that to communicate that to you that uh, I am now using the simulator. So this is basically the major uh, user interface in Backyard EOS. In the top uh, left corner, you've got your major functions here. Uh, in the middle, you've got your information centers, uh, the camera information, ASCOM focuser, ASCOM filter wheel or even uh, telescope controls. Uh, and then in the far right corner, you've got your secondary uh, options, uh, like daylight. Uh, you can have the full uh, user interface uh, red or bright white uh, uh, to suit your need, uh, and so on. So I'm going to start by connecting uh, the camera. I have a Canon uh, 1000D right now, an XS connected. So I'm going to go ahead and press connect. And as soon as I connected my camera, uh, a few options uh, became available. Uh, imaging mode, frame and focus, planetary imaging, and drift alignment features. Those are the four major features in Backyard EOS. And uh, now the camera information center is full with uh, uh, information provided by the connected camera, uh, the TV, uh, the AV value, ISO, uh, the dial mode, uh, the white balance, imaging, uh, the current image is set to raw and large JPEG, and a battery indicator. I'm using an AC uh, power adapter right now, so it shows AC. I don't have any ASCOM focus or connected, so that's empty. I don't have any filter wheel connected, so that's empty as well. So the user interface is defined or is designed to be uh, to have a natural flow to it, basically that moves from left uh, or the top left corner uh, to the bottom right corner. Uh, I'm going to move from imaging mode, frame and focus. Uh, to planetary and to drift alignment. You saw that the screen uh, didn't pop up any windows and didn't change all that much from one mode to another. And that's a design, uh, that was a design feature. I wanted the, the user interface to be as consistent as possible through uh, major features. You'll notice that the, the, uh, the biggest change is actually in this area, in the lower right corner. This is where the major controls for uh, the mode that you're in are located. If I go in frame and focus, the lower right hand corner of the screen is going to change a lot and is going to show all the information, all the major controls uh, needed for frame and focus. And if I go to planetary, that's that's the same thing. So the user interface is pretty pretty uh, lean in that respect. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't uh, change significantly from one feature to another. Okay, so I'm going to start with deep sky, uh, deep sky imaging, which is the imaging feature in Backyard EOS. When you are in imaging feature, you have the uh, option of uh, creating uh, capture plans. Uh, capture plans consist of a frame type, uh, light, dark, uh, bias, or even dark flat. Uh, consists of a name, uh, so basically I could be imaging uh, M33 right now, I could be using the, uh, I don't know, the IDAS filter, 
Uh, and uh, let's say I'm aggressive. I want to take well, aggressive. I'm I want to take ten images. Uh, bulb, uh, 300 seconds, uh, ISO 1600, followed by, let's say, 15 images. Uh, let's say bulb again, but let's go, let's go 10 minutes this time around, and let's change the ISO to 800. And then you can go, uh, go by and create your, uh, uh, your session plan uh, as you wish. <clears throat> so in this particular case, I'm obviously not going to run that session plan because it can get well, it will be a few hours worth. But basically, you have uh, up to, I'm just going to scroll down here, you have, you have up to 25 placeholders uh, to insert uh, different lines or different captures that you want in your, uh, in your imaging session. And that's the beauty of, of Backyard US or any imaging software for that matter, uh, in that it is there to take control over your camera. And that's, that's basically how Backyard EOS does it. You've noticed that I, 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 you didn't see any windows pop up uh, to clutter the screen. Everything is, is in line, embedded into uh, one uh, single user interface. And again, that was a design decision. Uh, uh, and basically, it came out out of uh, my own uh, frustration in using uh, initially EOS utility back in 2008. I was I was completely lost at the number of uh, windows that EOS utility would pop up uh, every now and then, and I made sure that uh, I wouldn't replicate that in, in backyard EOS. Uh, any questions so far? Am I going too fast, or is this a good pace? Um, one question. Okay. Uh, please tell me one more time the correct pronunciation of your name. <laughs> it's Guilain. Guilain. Uh, Guilain. Guilain. Yeah, close enough. Or you can call me Bob. <laughs> Bob. <laughs> um, can you save? Um, I, I don't recall. Can you save an actual session? You you can save uh, your capture plan. Yes. Yes. So oh, okay. At, so at I've the bottom. Done. Yeah. Okay. So at the bottom here. Uh, I believe this uh, saving capture plan is in the, is a premium edition feature. Uh, yeah, it's it's not available in a classic edition, but you got your load, save, save as, or reset. In this case, I could use save as because it's the first time. So by default, Backyard US will actually put uh, or insert light and the target uh, name. Uh, uh, as being your default uh, session plan, but then I could I could definitely add other stuff here. Says I don't know uh, October 16th, and then I'm going to save that plan. So that plan has been saved. So I could basically reset the capture plan here, and then I could load, and then my capture plan is here. So I'm going to load it here. And basically what that did is, not sure if, if you guys are familiar or uh, with Backyard EOS, but Backyard EOS basically always store your images into uh, my pictures slash Backyard EOS. That, that's the default. So if I were to navigate, say, file, go File Explorer, I'm going to go to my pictures. I've got a folder here, Backyard EOS. This is where all uh, your images are going to be downloaded uh, under your username on your computer pictures backyard US and the plans are also saved there so I've just saved a plan called uh, light m33 October 16 the plan is right here so nothing is is hidden in, in a database somewhere it's all file base and uh, it's all located into my pictures slash back backyard US as a default folder you can change that location in the settings dialog. We'll see that later on, but that's that's where they're saved. So yeah, you can load and save uh, capture plan. And the difference between save and save as is if I were to click save as, here, it, it would create a second copy of, uh, of uh, my capture plan. If you would click save, then if I made changes, so I'm going to remove that last line. It would just save uh, on top of the uh, existing plan, which is light m33 October 16.txt. I'm showing you the actual file name of the plan that you've loaded. So if I click save, it's going to update that plan. So if I do a reset now, load again that plan, the third line is gone because I, I removed it and I, and I click saved. So hopefully that answers your question. 
So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make a very simple plan. If you want to deactivate a line, you just set the number of exposures to zero and it's automatically deactivated. Uh, the data hasn't been uh, removed, uh, however, so if I increase it again, you see that it still has the same information. So I'm going to set it back to zero. I'm going to take only one bulb image, let's say of one second at ISO. It's pretty bright inside, so I'm going to bring down the, uh, the ISO. So once you're satisfied with the plan that you've program backyard EOS to, to, to run uh, with your connected camera. Uh, you have a few options here. You've got start capture and you'll you'll note that in the bottom right corner of every mode, whether it's deep sky imaging, whether it's frame in focus, whether it's planetary or drift alignment, your your action buttons for that particular mode are always, always located in the bottom right corner. So in imaging mode, uh, Start capture, loop, and preview. So I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to click on start capture. Backyard OS goes uh, and uh, runs that particular session. Oh, that was loud. Okay, so I'm having my camera point at a Canon EOS uh, box right now. Uh, so that's what it shows. Uh, so, I mean, any imaging software uh, will have a histogram. In this particular case, uh, it's obviously uh, overexposed because I'm inside. You see the red, <laughs> and the fact that the box is red uh, actually emphasizes the red channel to be, uh, well, almost uh, almost off the, the histogram uh, table there. Uh, but one thing that you've noticed, I'm not sure if, if you guys have seen that, but in the Camera Information Center, there's a box here that says temperature and it says plus 27 degrees Celsius. Keep in mind that I'm in Canada and in Canada we use Celsius, not Fahrenheit. Uh, but that's a setting that can be changed uh, in the settings dialog. Uh, if you prefer Fahrenheit, then, then you can go into settings and set that to Fahrenheit and then all temperature will be shown as, as Fahrenheit and back at US. But that information here uh, is now available. Uh, it is not the true uh, camera sensor temperature because Canon uh, uh, does not have a, uh, a probe directly on the sensor but it is very close and it is it is consistent uh, throughout images that you're that you're taking uh, over the course of the night so it is an indicator of, of uh, the temperature of, of the sensor inside your camera unfortunately uh, Canon does not allow uh, uh, any software to actually get that particular value live. You need to take a picture first and that data is inserted in what we call the EXIF metadata of, of the raw image and, and this is where Backyard US reads the sensor temperature. So each time you take a picture uh, I actually extract uh, the sensor temperature uh, reading inserted into the CR2, the raw file uh, metadata, the EXIF data. So that's why that information was not there uh, when I initially connected uh, the camera. So then there's a nice little feature here, loop uh, and preview. Uh, loop, when it's on, it's only a toggle on and off. And basically, if I start a capture plan, it will actually run the capture plan indefinitely until you press abort. So sometimes you're not sure if you want to take uh, 25 images or two, but you know you want to take images uh, for as long as you can. Uh, the loop feature uh, can come in very handy in that particular case. Uh, in this particular case, uh, I want to abort the feature. So in the upper uh, right corner is where uh, the abort button is. So I'm going to click abort and uh, and that's it. My session has now aborted. So I'm going to deactivate the loop feature here. And there's also a preview button with a big one. What that does is I'm going to reload the, uh, the plan I had a few minutes ago because I want something with lots of data. Uh, so I'm going to add that as well. So sometimes you want to get a very quick and dirty uh, 
look uh, if your uh, framing uh, target is properly centered, be it a galaxy or nebula, it's not really relevant. But you just want a quick, uh, a quick picture. What that does is regardless of your plan here, uh, it will take the first picture in your plan. So it doesn't really matter if I have lots of lines here. Uh, on the first line, basically it says 10 pictures uh, of 300 seconds. What that will do is it will take one picture only and it will take the picture according to the settings on your first line in your capture plan. In, th in this case it was a bulb image of 300 seconds. So it will go ahead and take that single image uh, in large JPEG only. Obviously I'm not going to let it go for 300 seconds uh, so I'm going to abort it and it comes back. So that's pretty uh, pretty useful. Yeah, it's it's obviously over, uh, oversaturated. Uh, but that's pretty useful uh, if you only want to see if you're uh, properly framing your target. Uh, initially. Uh, I'll, it's also used by Astro Tortilla down the, eventually and I'll, I'll talk about that if we, uh, if we have time. But for now, uh, just a reminder that the uh, preview uh, button uh, is, is going to execute the session plan but only for the first image in the plan. Okay. Not sure if, uh, so I'm gonna I'm going to click on this particular image here. Uh, Backyard EOS has a pretty intensive image file name structure. Basically, you can modify the file name to include all sorts of data. So in this particular case, uh, the image name is actually displayed here in the uh, top left corner of the uh, picture box. Uh, it says M33. It's a dark flat. Oh, I didn't know. I probably had dark flat selected earlier on. I'm going to take another one here. I'm going to set it to one second. All right, I just want to show you, uh, make sure I... One second. Okay. Okay, so that's the image I just took, a one second ball for one second. So I see it's M33, which is basically the target name that I've entered in my plan, uh, the frame type, which is light. Uh, it's one second, ISO 100. Uh, in this particular case, I have a lens connected. So when a lens is connected, I can actually get the aperture value of that lens. And currently the lens is at uh, f5.6. Uh, plus 37 degrees Celsius, in your case it would be Fahrenheit uh, instead of Celsius. Uh, and that is actually the sensor temperature here. You see it's plus 27 here. Uh, filter that I'm using, I'm not sure if you remember, but I've put uh, IDAS uh, in the particular filter that I'm using right now. Uh, standard deviation, it's just a number that's being calculated on the entire image. It can be useful to monitor uh, manually monitor uh, focus uh, as, as you uh, look at your image uh, during the, the session and just the time stamp, the date and time. This is the default naming convention uh, but you can actually change it to basically uh, anything you want and you would do that by clicking here on the settings dialog which is in the upper uh, right corner. I'm going to click settings dialog, settings window appears and the first option is actually file name template. So it says target frame type. So I'm going to click on the uh, on the ellipsis right here at the tail end and here comes my file name definition. So I've got target as my first uh, my first uh, identifier, frame type, duration, ISO. So you see it actually match what, what I said here. So you can select from any uh, of, I don't know, close to a dozen, maybe, maybe a bit more, different types of information that you want in your, uh, in your file name. And you can even change the order if you want. Uh, nothing prevents you from putting, uh, say, uh, 
file frame type here and here selecting, I don't know, full width, half maximum. So you can change the actual file name to match your personal needs. The default in Backyard US is actually my uh, personal preferred uh, file name uh, template that I use. Uh, but you have the option of basically uh, changing that uh, to match your need. Okay, there is some pretty neat information here in the upper uh, left corner, which is called the uh, log history. You can actually see a lot more uh, going on here, uh, which is uh, basically a history of all of all the actions that I've done so far. So this is pretty neat if you want to see what you've done so far, or sometimes if you have an issue, uh, I'm going to ask you to send me the actual log files. Uh, and uh, Backyard US logs a lot, a lot of things. Uh, those logs are usually cryptic in nature. They're not necessarily for the end user to uh, uh, to digest. But when there is an issue, when there's a bug, and I ask for the log files, for me, they're a gold mine uh, because it tells me exactly what you did leading to an error, and uh, it helps me a lot and trying to uh, troubleshoot those errors. So every now and then, uh, if, if you have Backyard US and you have an issue and I ask for the log files, the easiest way uh, to get to the log files is actually uh, go into uh, My Pictures. And in My Pictures, Backyard US also creates a folder called Backyard Temp. And in, in the Backyard Temp folder, there's a log. Uh, and these are all the logs, basically. And that's the log in my current session right now that I'm using. It, they're dated and, and the time that you started your Backyard US session. Um, and it, there's a quick way to get to those. It's basically from the log history. Open the log folder. It will actually bring you to that specific folder as well. So there's a few, uh, a few way around uh, getting into that folder. So, okay, so that's enough for log. Uh, it's not that important, but it's nice to know that everything is being logged in case, uh, in case you need it. So far, so good. Any questions from the audience? Raise your hand. Forever hold your peace. Doesn't look like it. <laughs> okay, oh, no question. Okay, hold on, we got one. Okay, cool. This is the guy who didn't pronounce your name correctly. Um, <laughs> you, you owe me a beer. Yeah. I, I just <laughs> want to say, you know, I, I've only been doing astrophotography about three years, and I have used your software from the beginning. Um, so I've seen it go through a couple iterations. And, again, I thank you for making it economical for us folks out here. Um, it's, it's a great product. But, anyway, thank you. get back to the, um, the settings. Um, I know there was a bug that was a little bit hard to resolve with the temperature with one of those temperium devices. Have have we pretty much got that behind us now? Um, uh, when was that? That was, it was a few a years back. Do you remember a while back? I guess because these are Chinese devices, if we're out in the field and we want to capture temperature and humidity. Yes. Uh, Sometimes they don't work, but apparently there's different versions of them out there. There is, yeah, there is. There is the original temper hum. There's temper, uh, well, and the original one is blue. It looks basically like a USB key. It's not. It's not bigger than a USB drive uh, that we all have, uh, a flash drive, right? Uh, it's it's about the same size, and they are blue in nature, actually. I should. I'm just gonna pop up. I'm gonna type in temper hum, and I have one connected right now. So tam per hum, and I'm just going to click images. So there you go. So this blue one is actually the original uh, temper hum, uh, which is supported in Macard US right now. And about two years or three years ago, they came with a temper hum version 2, which is that one here, which is uh, silver or chrome in color. And that's, that's version 2. And uh, you're right. Initially, it gave me it, it gave me a, a bit of a pain to support because they changed the interface. But they are both uh, supported uh, in Backyard uh, EOS uh, version three. Uh, right now, I have the Temperum version two connected. If you look right here in the 
upper right corner, the weather center, that is the actual ambient temperature. Uh, and right now you see it's reading data from Temporum version 2. That is the unit I have connected right now uh, in my USB hub and it automatically detects it. So I'm going to go into settings and right here in the bottom section, middle, you see the weather provider. Right now I've got it set to auto detect. What auto detect is basically it goes through uh, all the uh, weather provider that it supports and if it finds one it uses it. But basically uh, there's Temperum uh, and I support again version 1, version 2. It's version 2 right now that is connected. I support Yahoo uh, Where on Earth ID, uh, the W uh, O uh, E. ID. Uh, it's basically a, a code that gives you uh, uh, the location where you're at and it pulls uh, data from, uh, from Yahoo Weather. Uh, but you need internet connection and that's not always available out in the field. So that's why the Temperum uh, is useful. And a lot of users uh, also have uh, their own personal weather station that they have and uh, those weather stations actually can produce a text file uh, with with the current weather information, uh, Backyard US can actually uh, read uh, those text files and get the ambient temperature at, at the time of imaging from uh, from those devices as well. So right now uh, I got it set to auto detect. I'm just just going to cancel, and you see that my auto detect actually detected the Temperum version two, and it reads the information from from that little device, which is not bigger than a, a USB key that we all have to transfer data uh, nowadays. So yeah, that's been resolved uh, I'm gonna say maybe a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. Okay. Well, that's so great. so on, on that note, uh, because we're talking about that, I might as well talk about what the schmuck am I doing with that information in the first place. Why, why is the ambient temperature uh, important? Uh, especially if I do have the uh, the sensor temperature. Well, it's it's it could be a preference, uh, or or somebody could could be doing some some good stuff with that data. I actually put that data in the EXIF uh, data of each uh, CR2, which is basically uh, meta tags associated with every images in Backyard US. Every images uh, that you that you have on the on the screen, you can actually read uh, that metadata, and I have it here uh, in the uh, it's the uh, uh, the Rubik's cube icon here. So if I click here on the Rubik's cube icon, I see all sorts of metadata here. So Backyard US actually writes uh, its own uh, data tag uh, in the EXIF data uh, area, but right below here you've got all the standard. Uh, EXIF tag from Canon that the actual camera provides with every every single image. So there's a lot of data coming coming in here from the camera, uh, like the type, uh, the size of the actual image, and so on and so forth. But Backyard US puts its own data in there. It actually puts the sensor temperature, the time, uh, filter. I actually uh, use the IDAS filter for that particular image. I actually put that in the metadata as well. And at the bottom here, look, your ambient temperature provided by whatever provider you had connected at that time. In this case, I've got the Temperum version 2. Uh, and uh, the dew point is at 5 degrees, uh, well it was at 5 degrees Celsius when I took that picture. If you note here, this is live data, so it's now at 5.1, but when I took that picture it was at uh, 5.0. Humidity, the provider and the actual temperature. Of course that data will, would, would automatically be in Fahrenheit uh, for you guys uh, if that's what you set. And changing from Fahrenheit to Celsius is as easy as coming into the weather provider here and I'm going to change it to Fahrenheit. I'm going to save that. So there you go. So you see the weather information center now says 71.5 Fahrenheit and the dew point is at 41.2 Fahrenheit. And if I were to take a picture, the data inserted into the actual exit data for that particular image will, will now be uh, in Fahrenheit uh, instead of, uh, of Celsius. So in your case, 
you would set that to Fahrenheit once and then and then let it be. See the uh, actual uh, camera sensor temperature is now displayed in Fahrenheit. And just to make sure, I'm going to click the exit data for that second image I just took. Let's go down. Yeah, all the data is in Fahrenheit. But what's even more cool is you can actually put that into your your file name. I don't know. Maybe for for you, it's it's important to know that uh, the file name uh, contains the actual temperature, uh, the ambient temperature. So you could go into settings, file name template, and insert somewhere. Uh, let's say I don't really care about the sensor temperature, so I'm going to get rid of that, and I'm going to select ambient. So this is the ambient temperature. So if I were to take an image, it's 71.5. I should see 71.5 in my file name now. And uh, okay, so I see it here, but it is pretty. It is pretty murky. Uh, I should have inserted a uh, an underscore as a separator. So I'm going to put a say an underscore here. Because I see it, but it's actually uh, not well separated from the next uh, name item, which is standard deviation. So if I take another picture, I should see that the ambient temperature is 71 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's clearly separated from the next value. So there you go, 71F. So what? So the next question is is. But why? Why is the file name so long, and 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 why all that information? And the answer is, I'm going to click here on the icon, and that's a shortcut to uh, where Backyard has downloads uh, the pictures. So, which is basically, like I said, uh, username pictures uh, Backyard OS. Uh, all of my images. Oh, you can't see it well here, so I'm going to put that as a list. So these are all my images. So. The reason why uh, I opted to have a file name that is quite flexible in nature is, for me, when I when when I look at my folders where I have hundreds and hundreds of images, I want to see more than just uh, the target name. I want to see the type of, of uh, uh, frame. Uh, I want to see the ISO. I want to see the temperature. I want to see lots lots of different data. So. Just by look, just by browsing uh, in Windows to a folder where your images are, you are flooded with information about your image without even having to open that image and look at the EXIF uh, data or or any other mechanism to basically find quick and dirty information about your picture. It's in the file name, and it's done automatically uh, for you uh, as you are uh, taking your images. Again, it's the default format is my own personal preference, but you have the power to basically change uh, the order or or uh, the data that you want in that file name. Okay. Any other question? Uh, just one more. Okay. Do you plan on coming out with a CCD version in the near future? <laughs> Uh, somebody asked that question right before the uh, uh, right before the session started. Uh, so I guess I guess you weren't in the room. Uh, let me start by I plan on releasing Backyard Nikon <coughs> first, uh, and I'm almost done with that. Actually, I have my uh, 7000D and Backyard Nikon running right now in the background that I will probably show you guys a bit later on. But my priority is definitely Backyard Nikon, which is just a few months away from production quality. Uh, and then I'm, I'm not sure uh, if I want to uh, move on to Backyard CCD immediately, but I will tell you that. I own four or five uh, CCD. Uh, I own a, a, an SBIG. I own a QSI. Uh, I own an SX. Uh, I own what else do I own? Uh, an Attic uh, CCD, and uh, and I'm always disappointed uh, when I go out and use those cameras. Uh, and I'm disappointed not at the camera quality itself. They're freaking awesome uh, in in their own right. 
Uh, but I'm disappointed at the software that comes with each of these expensive uh, imaging devices. Um, and, and that's how Backyard EOS started in 2008. I was disappointed in EOS utility uh, and what it did for me, uh, for what I wanted it to do, uh, which is uh, astrophotography and not just daytime photography. So, <sighs> Do I have plans today for backyard U uh, for a backyard CCD? No. Do I want to build one? You better believe it. I want. Uh, but keep in mind that backyard US for me is is a weekend and weeknight uh, uh, thing. I do have a full time job. I do this on my spare time, and it's almost a uh, it's almost a second full time job now. Uh, but uh, I'm not saying no. Uh, what I'm saying is it's not for tomorrow. Yelene, I have a follow-up question about the Tempur Hum. Uh, yes. I bought, I bought the version 2, um, I don't know, about four to six months ago, and I'm running Backyard EOS 3.0.3. It looks like you're demonstrating, is it 3.1 you're demonstrating? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm showing uh, 3.1 right now. You see that in the upper uh, left corner it says release candidate, which means it's not uh, release uh, production right now. But the only thing stopping me from releasing 3.1 in production right now is there's one or two little bugs that I, I still need to address, and I'm just too finicky. Uh, I want to fix them before. But it is pretty solid. I have about... Uh, Oh, I'm, I don't know, I'm going to say about 100, 150 uh, test users that, are, that have been using it for the past uh, two or three months now, and uh, it's pretty solid. So that's what I'm showing off uh, today. There's a few subtle differences in 3.1 uh, that you don't have in the current production release 3.0.3, uh, but most of the changes in 3.1 is performance and pushing a lot of the uh, the process in the background so that the UI remains mostly responsive. Uh, but there's a few a few candy in there, and I'll I'll show you one uh, later on uh, in terms in terms of candies uh, in 3.1 versus 3.03. But the good thing is, <clears throat> like I've released Backyard Rails version one in October 2010. So it's about four years now, and uh, I haven't charged a dime in terms in terms of upgrades. My upgrades are free; they have they've always been free. Uh, there there's the premium edition that came along about a year and a half ago. There's a small fee for that one, but bottom line, upgrades are free. Um, and uh, and when 3.1 is, is released, uh, if you have a copy of 3.03, uh, you'll be able to upgrade for free. If you if you have a copy of version 2 of Backyard US, you'll be able to upgrade to 3.1 for free. And heck, if you have a copy of uh, version 1 of Backyard US from four years ago, you're still going to be able to upgrade for free. Okay. The, the, the reason I brought it up is because my temper home does not give me the proper temperature, and I was wondering... If you fixed it between 3.0.3 and 3.0, there is. I'm not sure if uh, there there should be even 3.1. I've just sorry, I went too fast. So if I'm going to if I click on the uh, settings dialog, uh, there is a calibration temp and a calibration hum temperature, humidity. So if your temper hum doesn't read the right value, or if Backyard US doesn't read the value correctly from your temper, um, you can actually adjust it in this field. Here you can, and, and you just basically use a regular thermometer, you know what the temperature is in your room uh, or outside at that particular time, and in my case, uh, there's a difference of 37 degrees, uh, so I actually entered that value as a calibration value. I don't know why some temper um, uh, actually don't, won't read the right value. I, I've looked at the algorithm; it's pretty, it's pretty linear, uh, but uh, they don't read uh, they don't read the right value. Uh, but the thing is, it's linear. So once you've set up uh, the calibration value, uh, that calibration value will will hold through uh, regardless of what the temperature is uh, outside. So it basically adds 37 degrees to whatever value is being read for the temper um always and Backyard US reads that value and adjusts it accordingly. 
So if your temperament doesn't read the right value in backyard US and you know it's actually 72 degrees Fahrenheit uh, where you're at, then you just enter the, the uh, delta number in this particular field and, and be done with it. Uh, it, will, it will actually add that to the value read by the device and, uh, and you'll be fine going forward. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. One more question. So, yes. Oh, I like that. <laughs> cool. Hi. Um, is there a way, I'm not familiar with the software, is there a way to take a preview that's been two by two? Uh, the, short answer is, the short answer is no. Uh, DSLRs uh, don't have a bin feature, and those fee and it's not even uh, uh, accessible through the Canon SDK. If there is one in the camera, uh, it is not being exposed uh, via the software development ca kit that Canon provides, and therefore cannot be accessed. But okay, it's, so uh, DSLR is not like a CCD, right? You can't necessarily bin. The software that exposes that is internally binning it and then showing it that way I suppose. Exactly. The image that you see in Backyard EOS is unaltered coming out of the camera and that is, I can't say how important that is. Uh, a lot of the time uh, users uh, tell me well the, the image is dark, the image is this and I can say with a hundred percent confident that the image coming out in Backyard EOS is unaltered, untouched from the camera. It is the same image as if you were using the camera without any software. And uh, and then and then and because that's the only way to actually get the image from from the camera. It is uh, an image as is. Uh, there's no opportunity to alter the image from what the camera sensor reads, from what the Canon SDK allows you to pull uh, from the USB wire connected to your camera. It is it is it, one of the same. And therefore, okay. you can't bin because because bin is not an option in, in a DSLR. Right. So the software I'm thinking of must do it only uh, after it the read over USB, and it it's only yeah. to help you do previews and get better signal to noise when you're just trying to find a. Yeah, that would be. Uh, that you, yeah, you, you, I don't mind. You can mention the software. It can be SGP, uh, Sequence Generator Pro, or or Apt, or or Maxim DL. That, that's all fine. There's my way of thinking at it is there's enough room for everybody in this world. So, uh, so if yeah. If you do have a, a faint image, do you have a way to stretch the histogram or, or something? I do. I do. Okay. If you look actually. Uh, yeah. Thanks. So if you look here in the upper right corner, I'm going to actually uh, take a very short image here. So I'm going to click on, on shutter and I'm going to, instead of taking bulb, I'm going to go down to let's say one one hundred of a second and take a quick image. So it should be a lot darker. Yeah, so oh, I might, I, might uh, I think I went a bit too dark, but I'll try to stretch that to see if I can pull some data. Uh, maybe I should have uh, taken uh, half a second instead. But here in the upper uh, right corner, uh, there's little controls here. So you can actually move the box. It's a level and curves, basically. You just, you just move the box here and uh, see, oh, I'm starting to see some faint detail. Yeah, so do you guys see that? Do you guys see that? Yes. Yeah. That yes. Looks okay. Good. So basically, it's just uh, it's it's a basic stretch, a basic level and curve. It is a screen stretch. It's basically done on screen. Your image file is actually unaltered, and that that is key. So I'm just going to reset that, and you can actually do yeah. So it doesn't work well on that one. So I'm going to select let's say, another image. And if you only want to do uh, levels instead of curve, you actually move your boxes right on the border. And you just and you just basically uh, move the uh, the boxes uh, on on each of the top and bottom border, and that basically gives you a linear uh, level stretch. Uh, but it's a one control fits all. It does levels uh, uh, levels and curve basically uh, all at once. And if you want to have everything uh, inverted, then you just uh, do a Z on or do an N pattern with that, and it, it gives you an inverted image. Okay, nice. So, so that, that's that, your screen stretch. Is that L uh, like a uh, LAB type decomposition? The L you have up there beside RGB, or 
Yeah, well, you know, it gives you luminosity, basically a black and white representation okay. of, of yeah. your image. Because sometimes uh, a lot of people want to see, don't want to see the color. They want to see the black and white, especially when focusing uh, and stuff like that. It's a lot easier in black and white. Yeah. So um, yeah. So. And the last question I'd like to get on: uh, What kind of pixel peeping can you do with the interface you have there? What? Uh, sorry, I didn't. Pixel I didn't get peeping. That. You want to look at the focus in the far corners and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, so basically, you know, do you see that the cursor right now? It's kind of a box with four. It looks like a target more than a cursor. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So basically, uh, if you right click, and I believe that's only available in the premium edition, I give you what is called a uh, spot histogram. So I'm going to right click on the mouse, and there's a bug. It's not working. Oh, that should work. Let me let me check another image. Let me load that red image. See what that does. Let me change here. Oh. So I got it here. Let me disconnect the camera. That's not working. Okay, so I'm going to go in frame and focus. So I'm going to take a note. Yeah, I found a bug. Cool. So I see the spot histogram here. So I'm going to come in frame and focus, and I'm going to see. Okay, I'm just going to close back here to S and start it again. I want to see if that's going to reset it. So I'm just going to click close, start it again. But that window that was popping up is the interface that will come up. Yeah, but I just wanted to show. I just want to show it to you in, in the actual uh, image interface or Deep Sky imaging mode. It it is available in Live View as well. Uh, I'm just going to increase the size here. Uh, I'm going to connect my camera. I'm going to take a picture. Picture is going to show up. Okay, so so I'll need to to uh, resolve that. So basically, wherever I'm going to take something that's shorter than that. Uh, that, that looks really good. Though. That's, I get the idea. Okay, you get thanks. the idea. Yeah. Okay. So okay, it's image going to download. Okay, so it gives you a bit more. So let's say I want, there's a red, there, I mean, you can just right click and then move around and you basically, it gives you a zoom representation of whatever is at the cursor location. So right here, there's a little dot. If I come here, it gives me a zoom. It gives you a histogram at that particular location. Uh, if this would be a star, uh, it plots the star graph. You can see the, the, the hump. Uh, the gray hump there, and then it gives you uh, all sorts of data on that particular location, uh, the LRGB values, uh, the maximum values, and the, uh, the low values of each channel. Uh, it calculates a mean, medium, standard deviation, and, and stuff like that. So you can actually inspect your, your, uh, your images uh, like that. That spot, is, yeah, that spot histogram is only available in the, uh, the premium version, by the way. Uh, so is the, the screen stretch. That's a premium version uh, feature. Okay. So since we just talked about that spot histogram, there's a few features here in, in the image box that might not be obvious that I want to spend a few minutes on. And uh, basically, it's zooming the image. Uh, here right now, the image is at 39%. If I click here, it's 100%. So if I click on the mouse uh, left button and drag around, I can actually drag uh, the image all around. And the spot histogram is still available in this particular mode. So a lot of people tell me, uh, and that is basically zoom fit. It'll just fit in whatever area it has so that you see the, the entire image. A lot of people tell me, or they send me email, uh, just a zoom fit and a zoom 100% is not enough. Uh, I want to be able to zoom. Uh, my answer is, 
did you try to use your mouse, uh, your mouse wheel? Basically, uh, it works just like uh, Google Map. When you're on Google Map and you want to zoom in or zoom out, you actually use your wheel mouse. And the zoom is located where the, the cursor is. It's the same thing in Backyard US. So if I place the cursor here on the dot and I use the wheel mouse, and actually zoom in that location and you can go as high like I'm at almost, I'm at 1500 percent right now so I'm gonna click zoom to fit so re no matter where I'm on my image let's I'm gonna click here on the on the D the zoom is located here is is focused wherever the cursor is so if I move the cursor I don't know on the uh, the slash here and use the wheel mouse to zoom in zoom out that's where it's located so it's basically limitless in terms of, of zoom in zoom out and it is it works just like Google map so very intuitive in that respect in the bottom section here there's your uh, thumbnail strips of all the images that you've taken in your session and this particular one I've just restarted back here so I, I only have two uh, you can actually uh, click on a thumbnail to reload it. So that thumbnail here got reloaded. I'm going to take another one that is a bit darker just so that it shows. Uh, so just so that it's a bit more obvious. So this one is a bit darker. So if you click on one image, it actually loads it. It's just it, it just goes like that. But one neat feature is sometimes you're taking images and they're, they're five minutes, ten minutes long and while the camera is exposing you don't have much to do uh, except maybe look at your PhD graph uh, and see how things are, are going. But maybe you want to basically uh, look at your image and if you know that one is bad maybe you want to mark an image as bad so that you don't uh, so that you can delete it later on or just make sure that you don't use it when you start. So if you right click on any image in the thumbnail, uh, you can actually mark your image as unmarked, good, maybe, bad, or delete. So if I click on good, what it does is it will mark the image as good. Oops, sorry. And what it does is actually renames the file name here to good. So if I go into my Backyard US folder where all the images are, uh, this is okay. There they are. Okay, so here are my images. I'm going to just going to change my view to details here. You see that this image has been marked as good, and 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 you see two images, right? Two files, the CR2 and the JPEG, because I've got RAW and JPEG uh, selected, so the two images are there. So what Backyard US does when you mark an image, it actually puts a suffix. It renames the file and puts that marking in front of the file. So if I were to change this one now, let's say to, oops, uh, let's say to maybe uh, I'm not I'm on the fence if I want to keep that one or not I'm just gonna click maybe and then if I come back here on my plan it's been renamed as, as maybe so you can actually mark your file as you go along uh, let's say this one is terrible I really don't want it I'm gonna mark it as delete uh, the good thing is backyard EOS does not delete the actual file. It marks as it, it marks the file as delete. You can see it here. It puts the uh, the delete marker in front. And the reason is, I always want to be able to say in 110% confidence that Backyard EOS never, absolutely never deletes an image file. And that saved me a couple of times where a couple of users were saying, well, my file, my images weren't downloaded, uh, files were deleted, and I can say with 100% certainty that it's impossible. A delete function simply does not exist in Backyard EOS. So I know it did not delete it. And in most cases, it, the user changed uh, their download folder and it was stored someplace else. So uh, Backyard US never deletes a file. So that, uh, that's a neat feature here if you want to mark your file. And knowing that it only renames the file, it never, never, never deletes it. Okay. Could I ask another question? Yes, I like questions. Okay. 
I have p been predominantly using my Canon T2i. Yes. And my question is, and I've never really gotten a clear answer, probably because I didn't email you directly. Um, when when I select 5x on the the screen to zoom in, yes. Does that to video crop mode? The the, the special feature in can in the T2i that's 640 by 480 and shuts nope. down part. Oh, it doesn't. No, no, it doesn't. Okay. No, it doesn't. First of all, so just just so that everybody follows us, uh, 5x uh, zoom is actually a live view feature. It is not a movie crop mode feature. Backyard US does not use the movie feature in any camera models. Backyard US uses the live view feature in every camera model. So. Frame and focus, planetary and drift alignment, those are features that uses the live view function in your in your Canon DSLR. So this is live. Look, I'm going to put my hand right in front. So it actually goes dark if I put my hand. So this is live view. And live view here, the 5x zoom, basically what it does is it, it really takes uh, on most model a one-to-one -one pixel resolution, meaning one pixel on the sensor ends up to be exactly one pixel in your image. So it's the best quality you can get. And I'm going to talk about that when we are in planetary because that's very important. But no, uh, to answer your question, it does not use the movie crop mode. But in on most camera model, and Jerry Rodriguez wrote uh, uh, a few articles uh, on that, and I believe it's in his one of his latest book, which is Planetary Imaging with a DSLR. Uh, he explained, uh, he talks about different models and and the importance of of five x or the importance of of uh, one to one pixel resolution in live view. And in on most camera models, your five x is the equivalent of movie crop mode because movie crop mode on most model is going to be a one-to-one -one pixel resolution meaning one pixel on your sensor equals one pixel in your image no image transformation no image resizing so there there's there's almost no loss of quality live view gives you a better quality because it does not alter uh, the pixel movie crop mode or the movie features uh, on some model actually uh, uh, it processes uh, the Canon software actually processes each pixel because what they, they're trying to do is 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 get speed uh, uh, because they, they, they it can do up to 60 frames per second in movie crop mode uh, where live view can only do about 2022 but those 2022 uh, frames per second are are unaltered basically Whereas the movie crop mode will actually do uh, some processing uh, because it's it's uh, it's a feature uh, used or or implemented for daytime movie shooting instead of nighttime. So hopefully that answers the question. I'll get back to 5x when we're in planetary later on in the session, but uh, it's 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 not exactly the movie crop mode feature. We have one more question. Um, yes. So I'm a, I'm a Nikon user, big time, yes. so th thank you for solving that problem. Okay. I'm also a Macintosh user, and I'm looking at acquiring a dedicated Windows machine. How much horsepower? Um, what, what's the minimum requirement to run this and PhD at the same time? Would, it, would they run on a Chromebook, or do I need a more powerful Windows machine? Uh, well, uh, Backyard US is a, is a, yeah, well, Chromebook, yeah. Basically, what you need uh, is a minimum of two cores. Um, and I say, in the speed of the computer, if you look at the speed of the actual processor, if it's 1.5 gigahertz or 2 gigahertz or 2.2, it is not as important as the number of cores. Uh, the reason is, is the more core you have, uh, the more multitasking you can do without affecting performance. Uh, so, so if you a backyard US will work better if you have two cores in your in your computer. Uh, because Backyard US has what it's called a background uh, service engine that does the image download, that reads the image, and that that manipulates the exit data, and that's all done in the back in a background process. And if you have a second uh, in your PC, then that service is gonna use uh, 
uh, is going to run on one core where the user interface is going to run on a second uh, on, on the second core so one does not impede um, the performance of, of the other so it doesn't need a lot of power but you will benefit from two cores definitely and PhD doesn't use a lot of power so uh, Backyard US and PhD and your planetarium software running on a two-core laptop, let's say with, uh, I don't know if you've got Windows 8 nowadays, you, you almost need uh, 4 gigs of RAM, uh, it'll run just fine. Uh, if you were uh, using the same computer for, for uh, processing and stacking your images, then I'd say uh, beef up your, your, your requirement or for image acquisition. Two cores of at least, I don't know, 1.5 gigahertz each uh, is more than sufficient. And basically, that's the specs of a five, six year old laptop. So if you have a laptop, I don't know, 2000 and I'm going to say 2010 or earlier, it probably has sufficient uh, power to run Backyard ES and PhD, no problem. Okay. Uh, just one more question. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. I could talk to you all night. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, your version of 3.1 that will is still in production, um, I, I mean not in production, will it address the issue of communicating with a uh, Mead LX200 in the ASK, with regards to the ASCAM portion of your ASCAM no. driver? Okay. No, I, I haven't touched that part at all in, in 3.1. Yeah, I don't know if you remember our, dis our little discussion last year with another guy. Something about the wrong, uh, Mead uses some weird procedural calls or something. That yeah, guess... yeah, no, I, uh, I haven't touched that at all in, in 3.1. So okay. the, uh, the short answer is I don't like to say no, but uh, <laughs> it is what it is. Is it fixable, do you think? Uh, no, or not worth I, to, your time? To, to be honest, uh, I don't remember the, the, the exact detail of the issue, uh, but the telescope feature in Backyard US, I'm just going to pop it up here, uh, the ASCOM telescope feature is, is only uh, to nudge the telescope. Uh, it is not meant to do a pointing stuff. I want to keep Backyard EOS in context of an, Im an imaging uh, software that controls your camera. There's some candy here and there like the ASCOM focuser, ASCOM telescope and stuff like that but the main purpose is actually controlling your camera. It's image acquisition uh, and sometimes the ASCOM telescope doesn't behave uh, properly and and it's basically out of my control because I interface with the ASCOM driver and the ASCOM driver in turns talks to the physical mount. If there's an issue in the ASCOM driver or there's some functions in the driver that weren't implemented, uh, then my hands are tied. I don't have access basically to, uh, to that function of that telescope and, and I believe that's the case uh, with the Mead uh, uh, LX800. Yeah, it was just a little frustrating because it your program talks perfectly to the focuser, the motorized focuser part of it. Yeah. And, um, and again, all I was trying to do is nudge the scope. Well, um, but again, I understand your your program is basically for imaging, and I, I can just open up another. Uh, yeah. Meat makes a little utility for moving the scope around. Yeah. Seems to work. Yeah. Okay. It, it's it's hard to uh, it's actually hard to be able to support all of those different devices when 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 I personally don't have all of those personal all of those personal devices to to run test against. So uh, there's yeah uh, short answer it hasn't been fixed yeah. or well, hasn't been addressed. Okay, you. you're welcome. Okay, so. Uh, Moving along, uh, I, there's just one other thing that I want to talk about the histogram that uh, we didn't really uh, get a chance to talk is we've talked about the RGB, the luminance, which is basically makes uh, a black and white image basically of, of your image. There's a, another little option here is to, uh, if you click on it, it says three, click on it, it says zero, one, two, three. It's just a toggle button. 
and it displays, as you saw, it displays a uh, line in the histogram. Basically, it's it's a small feature that allows you to gauge if the histogram is is one third in from the left or or uh, a quarter in or or halfway in. So uh, those are just nice little feature that that helps you gauge uh, the value of uh, of your histogram. Uh, so that basically covers it for, for that little thing that I didn't get to talk about a few minutes ago. There is a couple of options that you're going to see here uh, right to, to the, the right of the, the picture box and those options they're there for basically every uh, feature, every uh, mode, but they change uh, a bit moving from one mode to another, and that's because they're they're mostly specific to the mode that you're in. You, you've noticed that that particular icon is actually there uh, always, and it's the uh, presentation. <clears throat> a lot of the time, there's there's astronomy group around the world that are using Backyard US to do presentation, either in front of a live crowd or or they do a live presentation on the web, and they want the image to basically show full screen. So whatever image I have here, it basically uh, displays it full screen. So all the same features, the zoom is available with the mouse uh, and uh, and you can interact. So this is neat sometimes uh, if you've got a, an astronomy and outreach session uh, and you do planetary imaging, you look at the moon, uh, you can go into planetary, click into uh, uh, the presentation mode and people would see the moon full screen without any uh, application uh, Chrome or uh, any any application cluttering the uh, the, uh, the actual screen. So that's the presentation mode. Mask framing basically it allows you to load a, an image that you've taken either uh, before a meridian flip or you've taken uh, during a session the previous day or previous week and you're trying to frame this image basically uh, uh, as close as possible uh, to a previous session assuming you don't do any plate solving of course and I'll talk about that later on but if you don't do plate solving and you're framing your target manually then this control it basically will toggle just an option here I'm going to load an image that I took uh, a few minutes ago. Let's take this image here. What it does is I'm going to take another, so I'm going to deactivate this. I want to take an image that is just a bit offset. So that's going to demonstrate a bit more. Okay, so the image is a bit offset from what I've taken a few minutes ago. So I'm going to activate the frame and focus. And you can actually change the opacity of the image that I've just loaded from disk. So let's say, again, I just want to go, let's say I'm loading this image. So it loads the image. The default is 40% opacity. And if I put it 100%, versus 50 percent you can actually see the EOS from the previous or from the image that I've just taken versus the one that I've loaded which is the mask framing so basically what what I would do is I would move the camera around uh, take another picture until the both EOS here from my current image from let's say this image that I've took pre uh, meridian flip or from a previous session until they overlap uh, as close as possible. This way you can achieve manual framing, uh, almost exact framing from an, uh, a previous session or, or pre-meridian uh, flip uh, or so on and so forth. So that is the a mask feature here. So if I disable it, then I'm left with no mask at all. The mask has disappeared. It's no longer being overlaid uh, with the current picture. So that's a neat little feature here. But if you do plate solving, uh, then that becomes irrelevant. I mean, it, uh, not necessarily useful for you guys. Uh, if you want to display a grid uh, on your image, you can use that feature here. It just helps you sometimes to frame uh, your nebula or your your galaxy core to be dead center in in in, in, uh, in on your camera sensor. So basically, uh, you can use that for that. 
Rubik's Cube, we talked about that just a few minutes ago. It's the EXIF metadata. And that last option is, is just the, uh, the thumbnail. The default is the thumbnail is being displayed, uh, but you can, you can hide that if you want. Any questions on deep sky imaging or the imaging mode uh, feature in Backyard US? Because I've covered pretty much every option in that particular mode. So before I move to frame and focus and, and planetary imaging, is there uh, any one. question? What was that? Hey, I had one more question. As okay. I said, I'm not familiar with it. It's a really nice user interface, though. So, Thank um, you. I don't know much about PhD uh, either. I, I use Maxim pretty much, but uh, is there a way to interface between frames to do the dithering with PhD, or is that beyond PhD's ability? No, actually, yeah, you can. I'm glad you. Uh, I'm glad you brought it out. Uh, it's a bit later on in my script, but I'm going to talk about it right now because we're still in imaging mode. So there's a PhD button here that you saw here. What does it do? I click on it, double click. It doesn't do anything except it, it's off. Now it's on. It's off, now it's on. Well, what it does is, is in, it, it, it instructs Backyard US to actually perform dithering between images. So you need at least more than one image in your, in your session plan. Here, that plan has five images. So because PhD here is on, Backyard US would try to do dithering uh, at least four times in between, uh, in between each images. And the way to configure uh, PhD to do, so I'm going to start PhD. I only have like the, the previous version here, but that's okay. In PhD, what you absolutely need to do is enable server. If you do not enable server in PhD, there is nothing I can do. There is nothing any software can do. They will not be able to talk to uh, to PhD. So that's that's basically uh, enable server means open uh, the back door uh, in PhD so that other software can talk to PhD. There's a misconception going around that backyard US ditters or or app ditters or sequence generator pro ditters. Uh, none of those software do dithering, not even Backyard US. PhD does the dithering. So it's a feature of PhD that uh, with the enabled server on uh, allows software developers like me to uh, initiate the PhD dithering function and, and send parameters uh, to that uh, dithering uh, sequence as well. So, so you absolutely need enable server on. The first time you actually choose enable server in PHD, uh, PHD will or Windows will actually give you a Windows firewall warning, because uh, basically what it does is it, it opens a, a TCP and, and port on your local machine that we can talk to, that software can talk to. So you absolutely need to accept that Windows firewall warning. If you don't. Uh, then you, you're, you're telling PhD that, nope, uh, don't open that back door. I don't want any software to actually talk to me. So, so make sure you, you say yes to that uh, firewall warning. The good thing is you only need to, to do that once in PhD. Once you've done it, uh, enable server stays on uh, each time you start PhD. So that's a key here. I'm inside, so I don't have any camera connected, so I'm going to select a camera simulator in PhD because I want to demonstrate how, how dithering is, is actually accomplished within an imaging session. So I'm going to come here and because I can't do any calibration, I'm going to have to enter manual calibration data. So uh, so assuming, I don't know, I'm going to write that same there, so that's going to be this. Uh, I'm going to put five again here. And once one last one. Okay, so I just did my calibration in PhD. Uh, I'm uh, selected a star, and I'm guiding. Okay, so I have PhD uh, guiding right now. So if I come back in Backyard US, I'm going to take a sequence of two images. Uh, it's important to note that Backyard US will only do dithering for light frames. So 
and light frames, and you need at least obviously two image in your in your in your session plan. So if I were uh, to do dark, and PHD uh, function is enabled, and you know it's enabled because the button is is uh, is lit up. If the button would be uh, turned off uh, or darker, then a PHD is off, uh, or the back areas would not call uh, PHD to do the dithering. So I'm going to make sure it's on. I've got two pictures here, and I'm going to make sure it's light. So the combination of that button being enabled, plus light frame, plus at least two images, will actually trigger uh, the dithering. So I'm going to go ahead and start that plan. Backyard ES will take a first picture. And then we'll initiate the uh, dithering function. And I'm going to talk about uh, what uh, the numbers that Backyard.js reports, what do they mean. So I'm going to start that. So Backyard.js takes the first picture. It looks for uh, the PhD port. It found it. And now it's actually doing the dithering. If I go back in PhD, uh, I'm going to do enable graph. So this is my graph. I'm inside, so the graph really doesn't make sense. Uh, but assuming I'm guiding, the graph basically would, would jump a little bit around uh, because uh, I'm now dithering, which means PhD will move uh, the guide star in a random direction by a random number of pixels. And the number that you see in Backyard EOS that started at 2.55, uh, and then and bounce around basically tells you how far PhD is from the original guide star location to the new guide star location uh, post dithering. At 2.55, uh, PhD is reporting that it is still pointing at the original star guide star location. At 0.00. .00 PhD is reporting that it has now reached the absolute uh, new location of the new guide star. Therefore, uh, dithering is complete. Because I'm inside, uh, any move done obviously won't 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 uh, won't be correct in PhD. But bottom line is, you want that number 2.55 to uh, go as low as possible. But it will relatively never reach. Uh, it will actually never reach 0.0, .0 because because of seeing um, because uh, there's a few a few different factors. But the key is you want backyard EOS uh, to or or to confirm that dithering is complete once uh, that number has gone to a, a a low level. And if I go on settings or in the settings folder here. Uh, I have a few options here for PhD uh, uh, dithering. And the settle dither at it uh, value, uh, currently it is set at 0 0.25. What that means is I'm going to start another imaging session. And for you that I've used, uh, for, for some of you that have already used Backyard US and have done uh, uh, PhD dithering uh, with Backyard US, uh, you can definitely vouch for that, that the number that you see now at 2.55 will bounce around, but will eventually start to go low, low, low. It'll go as low as, as uh, uh, point 0.1 sometimes. Uh, but the key is that number is going to go down, reporting that, back, uh, that the PhD is closer and closer and closer to the new guide star location. And once it reached, I'm going to abort that, because I want to show you something. And once that number reaches the default value here of 0 0.25, it means that dithering is complete and, and was successful. Uh, and, and was successful. And w the next thing that you'll see is you'll see a countdown going from 10 to 0, which is a calm down period. This is the number of seconds that you want PhD to settle on the new guide star before taking the new image. If you increase the data aggressiveness, which is the amount of pixels uh, you want a PhD to move uh, the new guide star to, you may want or even have to increase that number to, uh, I don't know, I'm going to say 30 seconds or even 45 seconds to make sure that PhD has sufficient time to reestablish good guiding 
before continuing uh, to take your, your subsequent images in Backyard US. So that's just the number of seconds that you want Backyard US to wait and make sure that PhD has, has successfully uh, restarted guiding on, on the new location, location of the guide star. Aggressiveness, it's a value of 1 to 5. Those values are dictated by PhD. Again, PhD does the dithering and, and software like Backyard US can only send parameters that PhD understands. If you set the uh, dither aggressiveness at 1, PhD will actually move uh, the guide star by about half uh, a pixel in your gui guide camera, not your imaging camera. Uh, so it's half a pixel at 1, and at 5, which is the maximum, it is 1.5 pixels. So that's about the range that PHD allows natively. In PHD 2, you have another option called, I think they call it dither scale, and you can actually increase that value. So if the default aggressiveness uh, at 1 is half a pixel, and at 5 it's 1.5 pixel, if you set this value at 5 and you set the uh, guider scale or the dither scale in PHD2 to, uh, let's say, 2, then ultimately what you've said is 2 times 5. Uh, you, you've increased, sorry, you've increased the, uh, the uh, 1.5 pixel by 2, so dithering will now attempt to move uh, the guide star uh, roughly three pixel in a random direction. So you, you've double uh, the aggressiveness, basically. But the more aggressive you are, if you do dithering, calm down parameter is your best friend. Make sure uh, that you increase that value uh, to a number of seconds that is, that is sufficient with your rig, with your mount. Uh, to make sure that, that it settles properly before taking the next image. So if you're too aggressive, you'll need to in increase that number, definitely. Personally, I find that the default settings in Backyard US <coughs> works pretty good for pretty much every setup that I've seen. Uh, but some people uh, like to tweak those values. My advice is if you start to uh, change the uh, PhD dithering values in Backyard US, it is because you know what you're doing. You know that your dithering is not sufficient and you just want to increase it. If, if you don't understand those values, keep the default until, until you know you have an issue and you want to increase the dithering value. Other than that, the defaults work pretty good as is. Keep in mind that dithering uh, occurs uh, at the image scale of your guide camera and, uh, and, and guide scope and because people are usually, uh, nowadays, people are usually imaging at greater focal length than, than, than what you have in your guide scope and, and maybe 50 millimeter uh, guide scope that you have, then the, the impact on your f actual uh, image camera is going to be greater than, than what uh, your guiding camera sees. So that's basically how you, you, you activate dither uh, in Backyard EOS. Uh, you make sure that button is on, you make sure you're taking light frames, and you make sure that PHD is guiding and enable server is on. Uh, there's nothing more to do. Uh, Backyard EOS will, will do it automatically for you. One thing is, you need to be guiding. If you're not guiding, you can't dither. Does that help? Very much. Awesome. There is, uh, there is. I do have a support forum, uh, so I'm just going to come here, uh, browser forum.otelescope.com, and there is, there's a little, uh, there's a little uh, section here on how to, and if you click on how to, there is, there is a, a, uh, uh, a little thread here uh, called debunking dithering, and if, if you click there, I actually explain what dithering is. There is a thread on how to configure dithering in Backyard US, which is basically what I just went through, but I also explain what those values are. So if you want to uh, just have a little nice read, it's a very short thread, maybe just a page or two, and it explains all of those uh, parameters in more detail. Okay, so that is dithering. <coughs> there is uh, 
along the same line, uh, by that I mean interfacing with other software. You've, we just saw Backyard US interfacing with uh, PHD for dithering. There's also another software that Backyard US can interface uh, with, and it's called Astro Tortilla for, for plate solving. Astro Tortilla is free. I'm going to just fire it up here and basically uh, does, uh, does the plate solving. Uh, did I start? Thought I did. Oh yeah, it's right there. Okay, so Astro Tortilla uh, <clears throat> basically uh, is software to uh, do plate solving. Uh, it connects to your telescope using ASCOM driver as well. Uh, I'm not going to... Uh, oops. So I'm just going to connect it to a, an ASCOM telescope port hub. Okay, let's see. Okay, so going to minimize that for now. So it's connected to a telescope. In the camera selection of Astro Tortilla, again, I'm just demonstrating how to uh, have Astro Tortilla use Backyard EOS to do the plate solving. I'm not going to go through the, uh, the the configuration of Astro Tortilla. Uh, that's a different software. But I want to show you how, how it works. There is a camera option in Astro Tortilla called Backyard EOS. If you are using Backyard Nikon, you can still use the Backyard EOS uh, camera function uh, in Astro Tortilla. I made absolutely sure to keep the same interface because <coughs> I didn't want to bother the, uh, uh, the Astro Tortilla team or wait after them to uh, supply another camera option called Backyard Nikon in their software. So if you have got Backyard Nikon running instead of Backyard EOS, uh, the backyard US camera option is going to work just the same. So basically, uh, once I've chosen that, once I've chosen backyard US as my camera, there's a few options that you can set. You've got ISO value, the actual backyard US address, and port number. So I'm going to go back into backyard US, the settings option here. <coughs> there's a section here called third party integration. Enable TCP server, this is the same as the enable server in, in uh, PHD that we just saw. This tells Backyard EOS that, hey, third-party software may communicate with you. In this case, in this case Astro Tortilla. <coughs> and it's going to communicate to you uh, using port 1499. Uh, the first time that you actually click that box and save, Backyard EOS is going to tell you to restart Backyard EOS. And that is that is the that is by design, and the next time you start Backyard EOS, it will actually prompt you the same uh, Windows firewall warning. Uh, you need to say yes to that firewall warning. If you don't say yes, then Astro Tortilla is not going to be able to talk to Backyard EOS. As in PHD, you only need to do this once. In my case, I've done it a while back, so it's already checked, and uh, I've accepted the firewall warning, so I know Astro Tortilla can talk to uh, Backyard US. And it's going to communicate on port 1499, and that's important because if I go back to Astro Tortilla, the configuration is 1499. If I change this number to something else, I need to go back in Backyard US and change that port number to be the same restart back here at the US, re-accept the firewall warning. But my, my advice is, if you don't have any reason to change it, don't change it. So, let's see what that does. So, I've clicked back here at the US, or I've selected back here at the US as a camera. Uh, setup is fine. Uh, and now I'm just going to go ahead and say capture and install. So, <coughs> this should actually tell ba Astro Tortilla to talk to Backyard US. So I'm not going to touch Backyard US. I'm just, I'm just going to click uh, Capture and Solve. And Backyard US, see in the background, Backyard US is taking a picture on its own for five seconds. So <coughs> that picture is going to be downloaded, and that picture is going to be sent to Astro Tortilla. See here, and then in the... Uh, lower uh, status bar of Astro Tortilla, it actually reacted to the picture it got from Backyard US and it's trying to solve it. Of course it's not going to be able to solve the image that I have in the background because it's just a Canon box, but but it tells you basically what the flow is uh, 
uh, in order to uh, integrate Astro Tortilla uh, with Backyard US. So I'm going to abort that solving. Uh, so bottom line, make sure uh, that you select Backyard US. You can actually change the exposure here. The default in Astro Tortilla I think is set to five seconds. So that's why Backyard US took a five second shot. Uh, if I had set that to 10 seconds, uh, then that's what Backyard US would have taken a 10 minute, a 10 second shot. Usually five seconds, uh, depending on what you're imaging, uh, could be or could not be enough to get uh, to get NF stars uh, out to do the plate solving. So that's how you would uh, integrate Astro Tortilla with Backyard US. Any question on that front? Nope. No. How uh, how am I doing on time? What's uh, how many how many minutes or About seconds? About half an hour. Okay, so it's time to move on to firm and focus and planetary then. Okay, sure. so I've uh, closed. Uh, I'm going to close all of that because I don't need that anymore. Uh, that's not working. Okay, so there you go. So frame and focus. So I got my cam, my Canon camera here. I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna show the barcode because it might be cool too. Okay, so frame and focus basically it uses live view, uh, and uh, what it shows you here is is basically, uh, I mean, your live view frame uh, image. Uh, in the upper right corner here, you have what it's called the zoom box, and the zoom box is basically that square around. I can move and it actually uh, zooms on what I'm trying to focus on. So in Backyard US, to focus on a star, you don't have to center the star. The star can be in any area in the frame and you can actually move the zoom box uh, wherever that star is. In my particular case, I think there's a little, there's a little red dot here. So let's, let's, let's assume that this is my star. It is very faint, so you can move the, the zoom box by uh, double clicking uh, anywhere in the frame, and you lock it again by double clicking. So now it's it's locked on that little dot here, uh, which is not very bright, but that's what we have to work with. <clears throat> so once you've located the star, uh, can you get, can you guys see that little star, that little dot here? Yeah, Probably we see not. It. Yeah, okay. So it's not <laughs> it's not a lot to work on, but it is. It is what I have in my basement right now. Uh, actually, I have an artificial star flashlight somewhere. I should have I should have taken it out, but anyway, it's too late for that now. So basically, what it, what Backyard US does is it actually uses the data in that zoom box here, which is also represented here in in the lower uh, right corner with a star plot. Usually, the peak would be would be all the way to the top because. Uh, it would be a black background and a white star, so you'd see the uh, uh, the curve, uh, the V-curve uh, or, or the bell-shaped curve of the star a lot more prominently. But all that to say that the data of that particular star is then being used uh, to uh, by Backyard US to calculate the full width half maximum, which which is a very neat uh, focusing feature. What it does is it measure it measure the width of the star. Uh, that you're trying to focus on in pixel. <clears throat> so if I increase, uh, I'm not going to be able to. I need something more. I don't think I'll be able to. Uh, I'm, uh, let me try something. So I have a D sub cable here that has a green light on top of it. If I put that light here, let's see if I can have. The, that light more prominently and use that as, as, as a something try to focus. Yeah, okay, so we'll see how that does. So let's say that this is my star. It's a big star. So now I see a bit better what uh, what my star shape is. It, it's more of a of a bell uh, bell shape, <coughs> more of a triangle. But that's that's the data I have to work with right now, being being just a light. So you see the uh, full width half maximum value has gone down. So I'm just going to adjust focus a bit. So I'm going to go out of focus. You see that number has increased. So basically what it tells me is the number of pixel measured uh, from the left edge to the right edge of that particular out of focus star. Right now it's at 27.6.7 pixels wide. So the idea is you want to adjust focus 
so that you get that number as low as possible. Once you get that number as low as possible, uh, if, you, if I continue focusing here, <clears throat> that number is going to go as low as it can and then it's going to start to increase again, which means uh, I've gone beyond focus. So you see now it's increasing again to about 1920. Uh, so I know that my focus is around here uh, because I'm getting the lowest value possible at 16 point something. So that's how you would focus. Adjust your focus on the star that you're on until you get the lowest possible value. Uh, typically, you wouldn't get a large number like this. That's because I'm using a light off of a, a D sub unit, and that light is pretty big compared to what you would see for a typical star in live view. Your typical number would probably be around between 3 and 6, depending on uh, the focal length of your uh, imaging uh, scope and, and uh, camera uh, sensor size and whatnot. So a value of between 3 and 6 is what you would be getting. One important thing is it doesn't matter what number you're getting. There is no point in comparing uh, that number uh, with uh, the number that your uh, next door neighbor is getting. Uh, on that same night on a different star using a different telescope because the focal length is different, this camera sensor pixel size is different, so there are all sorts of factors. So there's absolutely no point in comparing that number with, with your, your uh, next door neighbor. Bottom line is you want to get the lowest number possible for a single star over time as you're adjusting focus. So that's it's basically it. You select a star, bring the zoom box to the star, adjust focus until you get the lowest number and it's usually going to be between 3 and 6 typically. So that's the full width half maximum uh, focus value. Uh, the next feature which is a half flex diameter uh, this is actually a uh, premium feature. It works pretty much the same as full width half maximum. The algorithm is different and one bonus is that it does take uh, noise into account whereas uh, full width half maximum does not. But it is the same concept. If you're using half flex diameter to focus, you adjust focus. I'm going to go out of focus. The number is going to increase. So you adjust focus until you get the lowest possible number uh, over time for that same star. So the concept is the same. You're just working off different algorithm to achieve the same goal. Pick one. Uh, I, I, I'm using, full, personally, I use full width half maximum. Uh, that's just because I, I don't know, I got used to the value that I usually get for the stars I select for focusing, and that's what I use. But some people will swear by a uh, flex diameter. They're pretty much the same in terms of accuracy. Standard deviation actually uh, is is not really useful uh, when you're doing deep sky imaging, but if you're imaging the mood or, or anything that is bright, uh, you can use standard deviation to focus. It, re it works pretty much the same way. I'm going to click here. It's the barcode. It's brighter. But it works, uh, it typically works with the higher feedback value. You see, as I'm going more and more out of focus, that number goes down. And if I go more and more into focus, the number goes, uh, the number will go up just a bit. So basically, I need to work with the higher feedback when I use uh, standard deviation as a focus uh, metric uh, algorithm. And you, again, you would only use a standard deviation when you're trying to focus inside. There's no star, and it's very, 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 very bright. Perfect for the moon. Uh, that's what I, that's what I would use. There's also a button of mask, and that's actually a uh, premium feature. Button of mask, what it does is it tries to, there's no spikes here. What it does is it tries to analyze the spikes produced by a button of mask and, uh, and uh, uh, calculates a focus based on that and provides a button of uh, error, which is the number of pixels. Uh, uh, representing how far or how close you are from, from actual focus. Right now, there's no mask, so there's no line to analyze, uh, and therefore the numbers are bouncing around at each live view frame. You still need a button of mask. I've been asked that a lot of time. It's, it is not a substitute. It's not, it's not, the algorithm doesn't work if it doesn't see any, any lines produced by a real mask.
So that's basically how you would focus uh, in Backyard US. Uh, choose your focus metric. Typically, I like full width half maximum. Some of my users prefer half box diameter. Doesn't really matter. The, the the principle is the same. So that's how you would focus. Uh, <clears throat> if you have an ASCOM focuser, then you can actually connect to one. I'm going to select one right now. Let's say simulator. Select one, and then I've got my ASCOM focuser control here. So if I were right now the uh, 9700, so if I go increase the size, then basically I can use that control to uh, control the uh, uh, your focus attached to your scope. In my in my particular case, I have a lens connected, so that's why I've got the lens control uh, here. Uh, it, it allows me to use the uh, uh, the interface here to drive the actual lens on, on the camera. So. Uh, that's how you would focus. Sometimes uh, we do imaging with uh, with uh, uh, an H alpha filter or whatnot, where live view actually won't produce any star at all because of the filter you're using. In that particular case, you will have to resolve uh, to taking still pictures of a few seconds instead, maybe up to even 20 seconds if you're using an H alpha filter and and star, you can't see star uh, in live because it's just not enough exposure time. So for that reason, uh, you can actually take a still picture. I'm going to take a three second bald picture here. Again, you you click uh, start capture. Back area will now take a three second shot and we'll display that image. Of course, it's going to be oversaturated because I'm inside, but it gives you an idea uh, of, uh, of the, the purpose of being able to take pictures. And there's also the loop, uh, the loop picture here, or the loop button here. <clears throat> That's nice if you want Backyard US to just take still pictures uh, one by one, uh, continuously. Uh, while uh, you're looking at your monitor uh, five or ten feet away or closer to your scope, you're adjusting focus manually because maybe you don't have a motorized focuser. So Backyard US, will, I'm just going to move the, the camera just a bit between frames so that you see the difference. <coughs> so the loop feature, pretty neat if you don't have an ASCOM focuser and uh, you want to be standing ten feet away from your uh, screen monitor, still be able to see uh, pictures being downloaded from ten feet away while you're adjusting focus to get the uh, full width half maximum. Uh, and the 64 here, which is the, uh, the the focus metric, that number is pretty big and big in, in not in value but in, in, in size, in font size and that's because uh, you want to be able to see that number from, from several feet away uh, when you're closer to your telescope adjusting focus. So I'm going to abort that now. And yeah, okay, and go back into live view. So that's uh, that's how you can focus using live view. Full width half maximum uh, H half uh, flux diameter or any of the focus metric works just the same if you're taking still images versus live view. The purpose is to get the lowest number value over time, always for the same star. And there's no point in comparing that number. <coughs> if you're <sighs> If you want to increase sensitivity, and I say that with a grain of salt because live view in a DSLR is just a few milliseconds long, so you don't have a lot of option or a lot of data to work with, but there's a little option here called HD, star HD, and what it does is it gives you control to basically adjust brightness of the live view of the image, adjust the contrast, and if you see a faint star here like this one here, maybe there's a settings in there that I can change to make it more prominent. There's a few options here. No, that one's no good. See this one here? I can now see that, that star a lot better. Uh, so I could basically use that to focus on. Uh, so if you don't see a star in live view, it could be one of two things, or, or one of three things. One, there's actually no star in your field of view, <laughs> so you're not going to see it. Two is you are so grossly out of focus that the light is so spread out that it cannot resolve any star at all. So for live view to resolve a star, you need to be somehow pretty close of focus and your star needs to be in the field of view. Or three, the star is just too dim for live view to pick it up. Uh, so that's when 
star HD may come in handy uh, to actually try and bring that star out. Uh, Logarit doesn't do much, invert doesn't do much either, and I can actually stack live view frames as well. Let's say that, okay, let's see if I stack five live view frames. Do I see more of the star that I can use to focus? In this case, yes, I can. So you can actually use a few things here uh, to help you see or enhance a live view frame, which is just a few milliseconds in time. Any questions on frame and focus before we move to planetary? We're uh, almost out of time. No. OK, so I'll go to planetary. Planetary, again, uses live view. And the concept is it, it actually uh, uh, creates an AVI movie that you can use Registax to, to stack. So uh, it's basically the same uh, as, in, as in frame and focus, where the, your picture box is, shows, shows you the, the live view frame. But here in the uh, upper right corner, you've got a couple of options here. <coughs> One thing is, uh, is good to know is when you do planetary imaging, never, never use bulk always use a, a TV value that can actually uh, can actually change the intensity of the image that you're trying to uh, uh, the target that you're trying to image being a planet or whatnot so never use bulb because Canon cameras have a feature called uh, live view uh, exposure simulation so I'm as I'm changing the shutter uh, the live view frame rate does not change that's because it is simulated by the camera and and that's just a feature in in, in, in almost any uh, Canon DSLR so as you increase the shutter to one second uh, it's not one uh, one frame per second it's the intensity of the frame uh, is simulated as if it was one second and exposure simulation is disabled in bulb mode so that's why you can't use or should never use bulb when you're doing planetary imaging so you basically play with your shutter speed if you have a lens well Chances are, if you're doing uh, planetary imaging, you don't have a scope. You have a, you don't have a lens, or you have a telescope, an OTA. So that aperture field would be disabled, and then you select the uh, ISO value that you want. I'm going to increase it, say, to yeah, to well, I'm going to put it to 1600 here. <coughs> uh, white balance. If you want a different white balance applied to your live view frame, your target. Let's say uh, it's. Uh, Jupiter uh, image count the default in uh, in backyard ES yes, is 100 I'm gonna say let's say take 250 images and start recording <clears throat> so the first thing it does uh, is backyard ES yes, attempts to do a calculation of the frames per second uh, it usually takes about five seconds to get uh, there in my particular case the camera and laptop combination that I have right now uh, gives me a 21.8 uh, frames per second. Typically, depending on the camera, you'll get anywhere between 18 and 25. Uh, there's one exception to that rule. The T4i is unable to do more than 10 frames per second. It's uh, that camera. There's something wrong with uh, with the speed in which it can produce live view frame. If you have a T4i, you will never be able to get more than 10 frames per second in live view. Uh, and that's true uh, even if you would be using EOS utility. It's just the camera is unable to do more than that. But all other camera model will give you anywhere between 18 and 25. And it also depends on your laptop's ability to process those frames. But what it does is is record. If I go back here in my backyard EOS folder, <coughs> there's a planetary option. And here's my AVI. Uh, so if I click here, that's the AVI I just recorded. There is actually 250 uh, frames in that particular AVI that you can use to stack using uh, the software of your choice. By default, Backyard US will also save uh, the individual uh, live view frames. So there's 250 here, numbered from 1 to, in this particular case, 250, because that's what I selected. <coughs> so <coughs> the reason why it also saves the frames in JPEG is AVI is an old, old technology that dates back to uh, the end of uh, to the 1980s, basically. And uh, sometimes there is issue in producing large AVI with lots of frames. So you always have the JPEG as, as a backup uh, to use to stack uh, using your, your, your stacking software, Registax or whatnot. And 
what's what's important is there's no difference in quality whether you're using the AVI or the individual JPEG to stack. It is the absolute same quality. <clears throat> in fact, those JPEGs are the one that were that were used to actually create the AVI uh, movie file. So, in a nutshell, that is planetary imaging. Uh, and the 5x feature was brought up a few minutes or maybe an hour ago. When you're doing planetary imaging, always use 5x. And in, in that particular case, I'm going to move the zoom box here and click 5x there. Why use 5x? Well, first of all, uh, the size of a, of a planet is is very small compared to the sensor size of our cameras. So you want to use a 5x zoom just to uh, get a narrow a field of view and and more detail. But the reason why you really want to do uh, really want to use 5x is it gives you a one to one pixel resolution. As I said earlier, that means one pixel on the sensor equals one pixel in your image, uh, which means no loss of quality. What the sensor captured is what you're getting in your image. It hasn't been resized. If you don't use 5x, your image is actually uh, being uh, resized here by a factor of 5. So there is a loss of, of, uh, of quality. So planetary, always select uh, a shutter speed other than bulb and, and you select that to give you the right intensity of what you're looking at. So as I go down here, you see that the int and intensity changed a bit. So never use bulb, always use 5x. That's the key. The only exception to that rule that I always say is if you are imaging the moon and you don't want to do mosaic and you want to capture the moon full frame, then you have no choice but not to use the 5x because you want the full disk to show in, in your planetary imaging. Uh, but other than that, if it's a planet uh, or anything else, uh, that fits into the 5x zoom, use 5x zoom. Uh, no contest, uh, it means the best quality you can get. Hopefully that makes sense. And of course if you're doing, uh, a, lot, a lot of people are doing presentation live, uh, the full screen presentation, uh, if you want to do live imaging or live uh, session demonstrating a planet or whatnot, a presentation mode is always is always available in every mode. Just one question. Yep. Um, does the sensor temperature work the same in this mode? It it it, it only comes up after you're done recording. Yeah. Yeah, the sensor temperature actually uh, is only updated when you take a still picture. So you, you so in planetary, there's no option to take a real picture. So okay. the information here is is uh, up to date as of the last picture that you took. So if you want to see uh, what the current picture is, uh, you can go into frame and focus. I'm going to take a quick picture here, mm. and it's going to update the uh, the sensor again. Canon does not provide uh, that metric through the uh, the actual SDK, so we have no access to it. The only way to get to the actual sensor temperature is to take a picture and take that data off the uh, EXIF uh, metadata. And uh, a lot of the time, if I were to stay, uh, leave my camera in live view for say 20, 25 minutes, depending, it might be less here because I'm in a house and it's warm. Uh, Live view will actually uh, shut down, or the camera will shut down automatically, and that's because every Canon camera uh, have uh, they have a a, a uh, safety mechanism that if the sensor uh, heats up too much, uh, in order to prevent damage to the camera, the camera will shut down automatically. So if you are in live view for extended period of time, depending on the ambient temperature where you're at, it is possible that the camera just shuts down on you. And that's a safety mechanism. And typically, that'll happen around 20 minutes or so, being in live view. So, if you want, if you're not necessarily imaging for 10 minutes, uh, you're waiting for I don't know the Jupiter's rotation to to be at, at what you want uh, for your imaging. Move away from from drift alignment, planetary imaging, and permanent focus. Go back into imaging mode. That actually. Uh, closes the live view mirror and will will then prevent your your sensor to heat up to a point where the camera will shut down. And when you're ready to start your imaging again, 
go back into your live view uh, planetary, uh, which will reactivate uh, live view, lift the mirror, uh, as a result, heats up the sensor and whatnot. So you can somewhat control that, uh, but it requires uh, knowledge on your part that the camera may shut down and you need to move away from, from live view uh, to let the sensor cool just a bit. Okay, that's good. I, w one other question. When you, uh, your, your personal preference for recording data, do you typically stream it down to the, your, your desktop or laptop, or do you prefer to, for speed, to, to keep the data on your camera? It's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm anal about quality. I'm not sure how to put that more politely. <laughs> My bottom line, I always want quality. And, and oddly enough, Live View with 5X will give you better quality than if you were using uh, movie crop mode and using your in-camera movie mode to do your recording. This is because your movie mode in your camera, Canon actually processes the data a bit, so it alters every pixel. Uh, because the purpose of movie of movie mode in your camera is actually to produce daytime movies. So the firmware in the Canon camera is optimized to create daytime movies, and as a result, will actually uh, process uh, your movie uh, your movie file in camera, and, and you have no control over that. In con, but it will give you 60 frames per second. So if you want more frames and you believe that more frames will give you the quality that you're looking for, for what you're doing, then by all means, set Backyard US aside and use that feature in your, in your camera. But you just can't use Backyard US to do it because I don't, I don't use the movie crop mode feature. But, but if you want your pixel to be unaltered as much as possible, uh, then you want to use Live View with 5X. So, but the downside is you're sacrificing, uh, sacri sacrificing uh, a lot of frame rates per second uh, in doing so. So it all, it all depends on what on what you're doing, on, on what your objective uh, is. So, uh, my personal preference is is I use I, I prefer the one to one pixel resolution in 5x uh, and a lower frame rate. Uh, than the 60 frames per second and, and have uh, the Canon camera uh, process the image as it sees fit for daytime movie uh, as opposed to nighttime. Uh, hey, uh, my sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that's my personal preference anyway. I think we're kind of wrapping up. I had one last quick question. I haven't used it on my T3i yet, but my understanding was they had disabled any sort of one-to-one -one mode on the T3i? Is that just the movie crop is? Or can you uh, that to your software? Uh, actually, there's one camera that doesn't... That, uh, the, I think it's the T3. I don't think it's the T3i. The T3i is okay. Okay, quick question as we need to wrap it up. Yes. Uh, very quick question. Um, is there a possibility to write some macros so that if I have to see uh, the live images after being uh, passing through a Gaussian filter or something, do you think I I can write it myself and somehow? Replay? I'm not I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. Macros to uh, uh, say for example, I have to get get the image passed through a Gaussian filter or a uh, filter and still see it live as in like, right after. Do you think yeah, I can add those possibilities. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't write any macros right now, or or any command. You can't send any command lines to Backyard US. You absolutely need to use the the interface uh, for now. But I do have plans on on having some automation put around Backyard US, and and that might be available then. But again, that's uh, just like Backyard CCD. It's not for tomorrow. Uh, and not next week either, uh, but uh, who knows what 2014 uh, holds. Uh, 2015, sorry. Okay, uh, I guess we're going to call it a night here. I think we're kind of in the same time zone, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Okay. Uh, any more questions? No? Very good. Okay, well, yeah, we want to thank you very much uh, for staying up with us. Uh, we don't have more work with a backyard DOS. Yeah. <laughs> it's so feature rich. It's going to run your life for a while. 
Yeah, well, uh, thanks thanks for having me, and it's a pleasure, and uh, and if you have any questions, I'm not far away. Uh, there's there's my forum, I'm always there, and uh, uh, if not, I'm just an email away. And uh, just thank you for having me. It was it was fun. I really liked the uh, the live interaction. Uh, again, that was that was for you and not necessarily for uh, for me. So uh, pretty cool with that. Okay. Well, thanks again for your terrific presentation.